We're now going to have a look at the subdisciplines of generative linguistics. And I said before that linguistics is a very, very broad field. Language features so much in, in all our goings on in the way we live, the way we understand the world, that this represents just one particular tradition within linguistics. And um, we're going to take through the six disciplines on the side there, pragmatics, semantics, syntax, morphology, phonology, and phonetics. And the middle four of those, semantics, syntax, morphology, and phonology, these are the core disciplines of generative linguistics. Pragmatics and phonetics are somewhat distinct, and we'll make explicit the relationships between them. But you should know, of course, that there are many, many other fields in linguistics, cognitive linguistics, embodied linguistics, biolinguistics, natural language processing, conversational analysis, developmental linguistics, neurolinguistics, social linguistics. There's um, a huge variety of ways language can be approached. And as we approach language from within these different fields, so the object of which we're talking, language itself, is changing. We're not necessarily talking about the same thing. So here's that stack with the four in the middle that belong to generative linguistics, semantic syntax, morphology, and phonology. We're going to do a whistle-stop tour of these. We don't have time to do justice to any of these fields, but you should know what the principal concerns of the field are and how they are distinguished from one another. And we're going to begin with the field of pragmatics and we're going to end with phonetics and both of these are outside of the generative tradition although they may be called upon to provide in insights that are otherwise unavailable pragmatics and semantics both have to do with meaning but as we see pragmatics has to do with context bound meaning in the real world and semantics has to do with an abstracted reified rational notion of meaning Likewise, phonology and phonetics both have to do with sound, but phonology has to do with an abstract notion of the role of sound in communication, whereas phonetics has to deal with actual sound, with tongues and spit and air pressure and things like that. So it's important to recognize the distinction between pragmatics and semantics, although both are nominally concerned with meaning, and with the distinction between phonology and phonetics, although both are nominally um, to do with sound. So we're going to start in the real world with pragmatics and um, with the distillation of the insights of the most profound philosopher of language of the 20th century, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who set out with a very, very formal approach to language, but ended up concluding that language, the meaning of language lies in the way that things are used. <laughs> language is used to distill it. And this is um, sort of a guiding light in pragmatics we make various noises at each other and we can ask how does the these how do these words or whatever it is sounds that I'm making how do they relate to what I want and meaning here is seen as complex there's lots of ways to understand meaning so if I say to you can you pass the salt I one could force a literal reading of that as if I was asking you about your capacities, as if your, your capabilities, and you could answer, yes, I'm able to pass the salt, and you might not pass me the salt. And clearly the meaning of the utterance has been bypassed here. So the meaning of an utterance like, can you pass the salt, is tied to the specific intersubjective context in which it's uttered. Now, all conversation... Um, is basically a form of cooperative dialogue in which I will understand what you say, hopefully sympathetically, hopefully in order to try uh, to uncover your intentions. And that is something different from trying to identify a single determinate meaning of a sentence. Um, a philosopher called Paul Grice introduced the notion that there are, in every conversation, some background understandings or arrangements or agreements among partners, um, such that when we're speaking, we're choosing to provide specific amounts and kinds of information that will guide the conversation and that will be, um, uh, will shape all our utterances. 
And the understanding here is that the linguistic interaction is cooperative, even if we're disagreeing, even if we're having a fist fight at the same time. There are nonetheless certain unstated rules, perhaps unstatable, that serve to structure this activity. He called these maxims, conversational maxims. They are rules in the sense that what we do normally accords with the maxims, but they're not rules in the sense that you're perfectly free to break them. Here are some of Grice's conversational maxims. The two that are grouped under the heading of truth are don't say what you believe to be false and don't say that for which you lack adequate evidence. And obviously you can flout these rules if you like. But if you say something and it turns out that you said something that you believe to be false, with that recognition, the conversation is now entirely changed. Our relation of trust will be disturbed. If you likewise make strong claims for which you lack adequate evidence, something people are all too willing to do, of course, um, if I recognize that you are making claims in this fashion, I will treat your subsequent claims with a great deal of suspicion. So make your contribution as informative as required, but not more informative as required. We all know the difficulty of this. Too much information is not helpful. And likewise, if someone seeks a specific form of information, something detailed, and you provide only a general observation, you're not being very helpful. So once more, these are um, guiding principles, which can be flouted at any time, but to flout them changes the nature of the conversation. The maxim of relevance, be relevant. If someone flouts this, we're in a strange conversation altogether and the conversation may break down. Similarly with the maxims of clarity, avoid obscurity of expression, avoid ambiguity, be brief, be orderly, all of which can be violated, but to violate them changes the conversation greatly. And these maxims seem to underlie most of our felicitous conversational exchanges. Grice represents one uh, particular landmark in the field of pragmatics. And this is a, an approach to language which came largely from, uh, from Britain and America, um, an approach known as ordinary language philosophy, in which a dominant tendency to think of language in highly abstract terms was resisted. And the simple manner in which everyday conversations um, proceed was the object of attention. To the conversational maxims, we might add the speech act theory of Austin and Searle, which look at all the many things that we do with words. In fact, How to Do Things with Words is a very famous book by Austin, which um, delivers what it says on the tin, as it should do. So this is the sense in which pragmatics is the study of meaning. It's all about the intentions of those who partake in conversations, how those intentions are molded fluidly, depend on context, um, and it resists formalization. We're now going to cross a border. We're going to cross the border into the world of generative linguistics. Within generative li linguistics, we're dealing with an abstract notion of language, an abstraction in which we consider properties of sentences which are determinate sequences of words, irrespective of whether they're written or spoken, irrespective of the context in which they are, irrespective of the intentions of the interlocutors. Clearly, this is, well, to put it bluntly, it's a very impoverished theory of meaning. The sense of meaning here is a logical sense. And the idea um, guiding semantics is that language is a means of picking out things in the world and referring. This is a very difficult notion philosophically. So we can't discuss everything that we mean by meaning in a semantic framework. Rather, we're discussing logical properties of words and logical properties of sentences. So to take a, a sentential example, the two sentences, all Dubliners are not dumb and not all Dubliners are dumb, have a particular logical relationship between them. If I assert all Dubliners are not dumb, and then you go out and bring me a dumb Dubliner, my sentence proves to be false. If I assert not all Dubliners are dumb, 
Uh, no matter how many dumb Dubliners you bring me, as long as there's one smart one around, my sentence is okay. And notice the words Dubliner and dumb could be replaced with an infinity of other examples here. The logical form, the, the relation that obtains between these two sentences is the same regardless. Of a word, we might ask, do these two words mean the same thing? So student and pupil provide a, a good example that illustrates some of the complexities of this because we often use them interchangeably. And yet, if you think about it, a primary school attendee is a pupil, but probably not a student. In secondary school, we might be uncertain which to use. And in a third level context, you are definitely students and not pupils. So there's overlap and a lack of an exact agreement between them. And these relations between sentences and between words are logical relations. Um, logical relations include relations of exclusion and inclusion, overlap. Um, and here's an example of um, logical relations that can obtain among words. Just looking at words now, not sentential semantics. If two words have the same meaning, we say that they're synonyms it's actually very difficult to find synonyms. So student and pupil, as we just observed, overlap partially in meaning, but not completely. A possible example of a synonym would be sofa and couch. I don't think there is in the world a sofa that's not a couch or a couch that's not a sofa, and it would appear to be a matter of free choice which word you use, and it doesn't appear to change matters greatly whether you use one or the other. It's worth noting at this juncture that a thorough investigation of actual language use would undoubtedly reveal differences between these because some particular socio social groups will tend to use sofa and others will tend to use couch. You will use the same word that was used in your family. <laughs> but that's not the concern of semantics. From a semantic point of view, these words seem to be synonyms. Now, synonyms are hard to find, but antonyms are quite easy to find. Antonyms are words that have opposite meanings, so up and down, day and night, perhaps, uh, in and out. Um, we have many such pairs, and of course, not every word has an opposite. The opposite of oranges doesn't have an opposite. Words have multiple meanings, of course, and semantics explores this. Sometimes we can identify a word that has several related meanings. Uh, these are polysemous words. So, for example, the core sense of chip is a kind of a flake knocked off a larger thing. And this gives us the chips that we have in the chipper. It gives us the chip, as the Americans call the potato crisp. And it gives us the silicon chip, as found inside your computer, which is also a thin flake sliced off a larger block. So there's a, a shared core of meaning here, even though those three kinds of chips are clearly distinct things. And there are other cases that you might mistake for polysemous relations that are actually something quite different. So we can talk about the bank as a place where you store your money. And we can talk about the bank of a river where you might choose to sit and have a picnic. And those words have different origins, different histories, and they don't share any common core. So they are what are called homonyms. So they've got the same sounds associated with their different reference, um, but the meanings are unrelated, essentially. And then there are logical relations of inclusion. So, for example, a polygon is a general term for a shape that has an, um, a, no a regular number of sides, and we can distinguish between triangles and squares and pentagons and hexagons. Um, so that each of those specific polygons, a triangle, is nested within the class of polygons. We say they are hyponyms, that is below. Hypo always means small. Hyponyms, and the polygon is a hypernym. And when we discuss logical relations in this sense, we're typically ignoring the context in which any specific utterance or written word occurs. <laughs>